were the Minoans and what do we actually know about this mysterious culture that existed at the very southern end of Greece on the island of Crete so so long ago way before the Romans long before the Greeks uh, both of which are cultures that we already consider to be ancient this fascinating culture, this civilization, often called the first European civilization, existed here on Crete at the very southern end of Europe. And here we are looking at perhaps its most famous uh, building, its most famous uh, settlement called Knossos. We don't call it a city. It's not big enough for a city, but in those days it must have been absolutely huge. And in many ways, possibly the inspiration for many of the myths that came later and worked their way into the Greek stories and ultimately into our own consciousness. So in this video I would like to explore some of the things that we do know about the Minoans and possibly some of the things that we don't and uh, in many ways we'll probably leave with many more questions than answers but that's partly because it happened so so long ago and we'll look at that in a moment actually because that's quite an important point to consider perhaps the most fascinating thing about the Minoans actually is the fact that we knew nothing about them until about a hundred years ago this developed and complex and sophisticated civilization existed around about 1900 BC till about 1450 BC and the Europeans, the modern Europeans knew nothing of them at all. This is quite extraordinary. We didn't know of their existence or nothing about their culture. We had no signs or traces of their buildings particularly. Uh, the only thing that possibly may have survived from their ancient uh, civilization were the stories that had been transformed and mutated into Greek myth. And this is why it's probably worth looking at a timeline now to put this into some sort of context. Because when you look into the past and you recognize the big waves of cultures, the civilizations that have occurred, that have risen and then fallen and disappeared, um, you're looking backwards in time, you recognize some of these names. We've all known about the Romans. People knew about the Romans for a long time after the Romans disappeared. Uh, many, many later civilizations and even nations considered themselves later Romans. They thought of themselves as heirs to the Romans. There were even some people who still called themselves Romans until the Renaissance period. If you went to Byzantium uh, or Constantinople and you asked them who they were, they were Romans still. This was part of the Roman Empire and we've had the Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne. So the Romans were very much in people's consciousness and because we knew about the Romans, we knew about the Greeks. We knew that the Greeks were there before the Romans and from the Greeks we have these stories, these myths of things that came before and for many, many centuries people just presume them to be myths and it wasn't until later archaeologists in the 19th century the late 19th century and the early 20th century uh, archaeologists such as the uh, British archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans and the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann uh, began to go to Greece which was opening up now a lot more and began to dig and 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 make uh, excavations uh, at particular sites trying to prove that these Greek myths were true and that was their aim. Their aim was to prove that these mysterious stories had their origins in, in earlier civilizations. We can see from this timeline here we are that actually two new civilizations were discovered uh, by these archaeologists the Mycenaeans that existed long before the Greeks and before them even further back the Minoans and so these discoveries changed the way that the world or certainly the Europeans viewed their history they knew that the Babylonians and the Egyptians and the Sumerians had existed in the Middle East and North Africa long before but in Europe the existence of earlier civilizations before the Greeks uh, what had been had just not been considered at all. And on Crete, 
at the site of Knossos, Sir Arthur Evans struck lucky. There had already been some interest in this area um, around Knossos, uh, but it was Sir Arthur Evans who, who went in in the year 1900 and his dig definitively discovered the Minoan civilization. These days, archaeologists are much, much more careful about the way they dig and record uh, everything they find and sift through the different layers. In those days, archaeology was still very much a new science, a new discipline. Um, they, they just dug straight down, hoping to find things very quickly. And so lots of things that we would do differently today um, uh, would have perhaps shown different levels of development. Um, but in the event, what he did do was he opened up this huge site to us and discovered the Minoan civilization. And there are some great photos of him and his team digging around and excavating this site, discovering all sorts of passageways and chambers full of pots and various rooms and larger rooms. And of course, there's this room that he discovered, which is in many ways the definitive discovery at Knossos. This is the throne room, or at least he called it the throne room. And on finding this wonderful throne, uh, clearly belonging to somebody powerful and rich, to have something as, as fine and uh, complicated as this throne, this was the proof for Sir Arthur Evans that he had discovered the ancient city of King Minos. And that's why he called them the Minoans. The throne itself is clearly a place of power. This room, clearly um, a local lord of some sort, somebody really quite important, surrounded by these frescoes. Frescoes are important. Um, they are paintings made on plaster while it's still wet. And the result is that they do survive. Unlike a painting that's painted on, on dry walls or, or on different materials like wood or canvas, they rot eventually, whereas frescoes survive. And these frescoes have survived incredibly well. Many of them have been restored. A lot of Arthur Evans' restoration work um, would never be done today. He over-restored things, but we can still see the basics in place. And so this throne room, surrounded by frescoes, at the middle of this beautiful palace as he called it um, was clearly uh, seen as a site of power and possibly the site of the legendary King Minos. Don't forget in those days they were always trying to link them back to the Greek myths and this particular connection with Minos works really well because of various uh, things that were found on the site connected with bulls so there are some great frescoes of um, People bull leaping must have been some kind of a uh, an, an equivalent to what we see in, in Spain and southern France today with bull fighting and bull jumping. And these huge bull's horns that were discovered on the site as well. Uh, what they were used for, we no idea at all. Possibly uh, some religious significance or maybe a sacrificial altar. Possibly they were some sort of a warning sign. A lot of people think they may have been used for practicing the jumping on. Uh, we don't know. But the fact that there were lots of bulls references, including this, this, this wonderful discovery here, um, and the fact that the entire site must have felt like a, a maze, a huge labyrinth, led Evans to thinking that possibly this was connected with the Greek myth of the labyrinth. And at the heart of the labyrinth was the, the monster, the half bull, half man, minotaur. And therefore, in his mind, all of this connected to prove that actually the Greeks didn't make up the story. That there was a place that was a complicated palace full of little passageways like a maze with some sort of a, a bull-like monster at the heart of it, possibly. None of this, of course, can be proven to be true. Uh, it could be that there's the kernel of, of reality at the, at the very heart of this myth that began with a distant palace uh, where they worshipped bulls. We just don't know. We have no idea. What we do have is an amazing archaeological site, a place with its storage jars and pots uh, with, with traces of, of the materials or the, the, the products that they traded in. We know that this would have been at the heart 
of, of, a, of a trading network, uh, selling and buying uh, olive oil and, and wood and wine. We know from the layout of Knossos that there was a very large space at the middle. We often find these open spaces at the centres of, of Minoan settlements. Uh, were they marketplaces? That's possible for trading. Were they possibly used as big open air arenas for for the bullfighting, for the bull leaping, or for other uh, possibly other festivals or religious rituals? We don't know, but it's clearly part of the Minoan culture that was discovered when they dug up this site. Other artefacts that we found give us uh, various uh, different clues as to what their society might have been like. Uh, lots of images of sea creatures. We have these wonderful frescoes with dolphins swimming around. We have a lot of pottery with images of deep sea creatures, octopuses and other things that might have been washed up, we think possibly after a huge eruption that occurred in 1628. The island of Thera, just to the north of Crete, erupted at that time and would have caused a huge wave, uh, a huge tsunami and may well have washed up quite a lot of, of debris or deep sea monsters in their eyes and this possibly uh, then became um, one of the one of the subjects of their art that they became interested in. There's another really interesting element to um, to the Minoan civilization, and that is possibly, uh, again, there's no proof, but possibly the fact that women perhaps played more of a role in their society than later cultures. We see these frescoes of of very beautiful women uh, with with almost modern hairstyles and and with jewelry and with their faces uncovered that's quite important uh, much much later um, in Greece uh, one would have seen um, Athenian women at the height of the classical period covered from head to toe pretty well whereas these images suggest that women uh, possibly uh, may have played a bigger role or a more equal role in their culture one of these women is nicknamed La Parisienne because the um, the archaeologists felt that she actually looked like a modern Parisian woman uh, compared with one's traditional views of how these ancient cultures treated their women. There's also a very famous snake goddess sculpture. It's very small. The Minoans didn't do big sculpture, not like the Egyptians and the Babylonians. They were much more interested in small-scale uh, items and objects and one of them is this snake goddess who um, it could be she could be a figure of religious importance she could be a priestess we don't know but the point is that she's a she and and there she is um, uh, clearly playing a role of some sort in their society but there are still lots of questions about the Minoans we still don't know much um, a lot of people have suggested that not only did they treat their women perhaps with more equality, but they were also possibly less warlike. And the reason they say this is that their their cities uh, and their, their settlements uh, don't seem to have any, any defensive walls. Perhaps they were acted more as kind of open market centres in a network of, of similar settlements without so much fighting. Uh, we don't know. It's possible, it, but we'll never know much more than we do now about the Minoans. We don't even call their settlements cities and towns. Um, we call them palaces for the bigger ones and villas for the smaller ones. These are modern names that were given to these things by later archaeologists, uh, but um, we don't know what they called them themselves. We don't even know what they called themselves. We call them the Minoans, and that's just because of Arthur Evans's obsession with the Greek myths. Um, we have no idea what they called themselves, and that is because we don't have any written records. Well, well, we do. We have these Linear A and Linear B tablets. Uh, Linear B is mainly from the later Mycenaean period. We have deciphered Linear B. We do know what that is. But Linear A remains a mystery, and perhaps if we could solve 
this particular script and work out what the language said, we might actually have some written records from the Minoans. But apart from that, we, we simply have to go on what we find in the ground and, and look at their objects and their artifacts to work out what they were like. If you are in Oxford and you are able to go to the Ashmolean Museum, there are some uh, great artifacts, some of them copies, uh, I think most of them copies, but very, very good copies of things that were found um, here in Knossos and other sites. Um, Arthur Evans was based here anyway, so therefore um, there's quite a connection with the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, well worth a visit if you're interested in the Minoans and any of this has caught your imagination and fired you up to go and find out some more. So those were the Minoans. Many experts actually see the Minoans as an extension of the Middle Eastern cultures, actually, um, not strictly speaking European. However, the fact that they were here in Crete and in southern Greece means that geographically uh, Europe's first real civilization with, with settlements, with organized society, and, and with some extraordinary works of art and, and wonderful buildings uh, were the Minoans. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting and enjoyed it. And if it spurred you on to find out more things about the ancient world or about civilizations and art history, then please check out my channel, Lockdown Learning. And here you'll find all sorts of other bits and pieces to do with uh, not only the sort of stuff that you've been looking at today, but also language learning and EPQs. Thank you.